we, we started last time talking about the, um, our relationship with God, how it was going to differ in heaven than with the relationship we currently have. And then the question becomes, what is it going to be like for God to dw- actually dwell among us? What is, what, we, we talked about the relationship, but what, what else do we need to understand about that that we can discern from what the Bible actually tells us? So we're going to look at, we're going to look at a, a good bit of Scripture tonight, both Old Testament and New Testament. We're going to look at what some of the, the old theologians have said. We're going to look at some com- comments by Alcorn try to get a perspective from a lot of different views of uh, you know, what that should look like, what that should be like. What do we need to be prepared for? How will we relate to God? Uh, if he's an omnipresent God, is he omnipresent in heaven, meaning that he is, he is, we're consciously aware that he is always there? Will, will that be the case? Will we consciously be aware that he's always there? Right now, we, we have a tendency to get busy and we don't think about God being everywhere and he's right there with us, but what, what will it be like when we're in heaven? So those are some of the things we're talking about. Uh, in Eden, God, God came down to earth, the home of mankind, whenever he wished, Genesis 3.8. On the new earth, God and mankind will be able to come to each other whenever they wish. Uh, Leviticus says it this way, I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. Uh, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. Uh, Very similar wording in Ezekiel, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. When we get over to the New Testament, again, similar language, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And then in Revelation, I want us to think about this one a minute because we're going to look at one particular word here. It's in Revelation 21.3, it says, God himself will be with them. Now the question is, why does it say himself? God himself will be with us. What's the difference in that and saying God will be with us and we will be with him. God himself will be with us. Microphone there. Okay. It seems more personalized. Okay. Like a a finite, more finite. Okay. It's more personalized. What... um, let me ask the follow-up question to that, which either one of you can, can contribute to. What, <laughs> I don't know how to say it without, how to ask the question without giving away the answer. What does that, um, what will the fullness of, of that personalization, how will that be different than what we, what we know now? Uh, the, the actual living it out. Well, I would think it would be more like in the Garden of Eden where he walked and man looked face to face to him and talked to him okay. as opposed to... Yeah, and we looked at that some of that last week with the, when we talked about being face to face and how we, couldn't, we can't do that now, but we'll be able to do that then. Uh, what else? Anybody else? Well, I'm guessing from how this other part has gone that I'm kind of on the wrong track here, but I was thinking when it says God himself, I was thinking of the truly the God portion of the Trinity. Okay. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, the totality of that should be pretty overwhelming, but... What will be, well, let's just go on. I think we'll get there. Because God won't merely send us a delegate, he will actually come and live among us. Uh, He's not going to send us, send Jesus. He's not going to send a prophet. He is actually coming to live among us. Stephen J. Lawson explains it this way. He says, God's glory will fill and permeate the entire new heaven. 
not just one centralized place. Thus, wherever we go in heaven, we will be in the immediate presence and the full glory of God. Wherever we go, we will enjoy the complete manifestation of God's presence. Throughout all eternity, we will never be separated from direct, unhindered fellowship with God. Those, those, those two words, direct and unhindered fellowship with God. Now, what that, I think, equates to and what I'm trying to get to is the, the total comfort of that relationship and having him present everywhere and being aware of his presence everywhere. In this world, even as Christians, we get, I think all of us can attest to the fact that we get preoccupied during the course of the day. We don't think about God just being right there with us. We, you know, we're doing things and then, you know, maybe we go, okay, well, I'm going to pray now. You know, well, now God, can you hear me now? But he's always there. But then there's going to be this awareness. It will be unhindered and it will be direct. Remember we talked about last week, on both in the message and, and uh, on Wednesday night, how when the veil was rent, there was direct access. There is a comparable nature to this, that the, the, the veil has been rent. You, you, you went into the Holy of Holies, but now you're in the Holy of Holies, and the very uh, presence of God, and you're very aware of it, and you're always very aware of it, and yet, because, and this is really important, because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, there, there is never, and we'll look at this in a minute, but I'm going to say it while I've got it on my mind, we'll, there's never a sense in which there is uh, any awareness of sin in our life, so there's nothing between us and God that, that inhibits that relationship. There, that it's a perfect relationship. There's, as uh, is, is, uh, one of the authors that I quote here said, you're not ever going to have the other shoe drop and go, oh my goodness, now I can't be in the presence of God. Why? Because Christ has already paid the full price. You were in a perfect state. You were before a holy God. And it's a very, and that, even in the presence of total holiness, is a totally comfortable, wonderful, intimate, uh, passionate relationship with a holy God. So that, that's entirely different. God's glory will permeate the entire, and he will never be a, a separated from the direct, unhindered fellowship with God. The beatitude of heaven. Before we go any further, I just love that phrase. Is the reason I, I put this quote in there, and this is not mine. This is from somebody else. Uh, the beatitude of heaven. What is a beatitude? What are the beatitudes in Matthew? Blessing or the word happiness uh, has been translated happiness. Blessed is, blessed are, those, uh, blessed are. Uh, that's a beatitude. Uh, the beatitude of heaven, the blessedness of heaven, consists essentially in the vision, love, and enjoyment of God himself. Now, we've already talked about the fact that on this new earth, uh, there's going to be things for us to do and enjoy, maybe things that we enjoy now. But in the midst of any of those things, let, let's say that you, uh, like Elva or Ruth, you just enjoy gardening. Perhaps there are gardens for us to tend there, like there was in the Garden of Eden. But always in the presence of God, and always those things you are doing being of such great enjoyment because they are magnifying the glory of God. The very nature of those things, uh, to climb a mountain and to get to the top and look out at the wonders of God's creation becomes magnified dramatically by the fact that, that God is present in the midst of all of that. And you're very aware with that. It's a direct uh, corollary between this beautiful creation and God what God has done in allowing you to be there. So everything that you're doing is in the very presence uh, of a holy God. So the beatitude of heaven consists essentially of the vision, love, and enjoyment of God himself. In heaven will at last be freed of self-righteousness and self-deceit. Let's stop there. 
And I think that deserves a stopping place. What is the, one of the greatest hindrances of all of us who are Christians genuinely walking in the Spirit and walking by faith? Self-deceptions, that whole self thing. Uh, the self-deception. Well, you know, I, I live pretty good today. I mean, compared to that guy living down there next to me, I lived real good today. This whole idea of comparisons or self-deception, it won't be necessary. Why? Because there won't be any dissension between you and a holy God. It will be a perfect relationship. So we're, we're absent any of those things that maybe we don't even intend. That self-deception sometimes I don't think is an intent that we just go, well, I'm going to deceive myself today so that I'll feel better about myself. Now, I think sometimes we're almost that methodical in our thought processes, but, but in reality, there's not even uh, the chance for us to be self-deceived. We're, we're, we're not deceiving ourselves and then building somehow a chasm between us and a holy God because of that self-deception. It literally is not there. So when we talk about heaven and it being the perfect place and we talk about God and we even talked about, remember not too many weeks ago we talked about evil and we said evil was a privation it is an it is the that which is missing which is perfect or that which is less than perfect so with all of that gone there is no self deception with all of that gone with the with that which is deceiving or is a privation from us gone all we have is perfection and perfection in relationship perfection and in, in a in a this living out our lives every day we'll no longer question god's goodness uh, while Pastor Tom and I were eating lunch today, I got a call from uh, a lady in Arkansas, which, who you can imagine. I won't say her name because we're taping this. But um, I talked to her on the phone for probably 10, 15 minutes maybe. Um, but her, her question came down to, was she doing the right things? And you don't have to question that anymore. Now, this, this is a solid Christian lady who has been involved in prayer. Listen, listen. She's been involved in prayer on a, sometimes multiple times a day for exactly the same thing for over 30 years. And, her, and in her mind, that prayer has not been answered yet. Now, if you were in that situation, maybe some of you have been, would you not question, am I praying the right thing? Or am I, am I, should I be doing something different? Or, you know, that, those were her questions to me today. Well, once we're there, there is none of that. We'll have none of this fooling ourselves. There'll no longer be a question about God's goodness and any of that. And one of her comments to me today was, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of angry with God right now. I'm questioning, you know, these things. Am I doing the right thing? Is he really with me? Uh, those are the questions. Well, if, if you had been praying the same thing multiple times a day for 30 years, faithfully, as she has, and there seems to be no answer to the prayer, in fact, things have gotten worse. How would you question God? And the answer to that is even if you're as faithful and wonderful a Christian as she is, there are times that you can come to that place. I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've confessed this to you before. When I get really tired, it's when those kind of things creep in. When I get really tired, I make bad decisions. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even think about my relationship with God in the right way. So the weariness of just being drugged down from, from, a, from the, 
And, and listen, prayer is a hard work if it's done well. Yeah. Prayer is hard work. And she's been doing this for 30 years. Uh, she's weary. And, you know, we just we had a short conversation. But uh, there's none of that in heaven. We'll see it. We'll see God's goodness. We'll savor it. We'll enjoy it and declare it to our companions. Surely we will wonder how we ever could have doubted his goodness. For then our faith will be sight. That whole understanding of faith becoming sight, that's the transition, that transformation, that transfiguration that happens in us when we enter the presence of God in, in, in the heavenly state, that our faith literally then becomes sight. We've all said those words, we've heard those words preached, but think about the literalness of that, when our faith really becomes sight. Suddenly you're face to face with a holy God and there's no fear. In his, in his presence, in his perfection, face to face, nose to nose, looking into his eyes, seeing Jesus for who he is. And there's, there's not, even, not only no fear, but there's exhilaration. There's adoration. There's joy. Uh, the total absence of having any of those things that, that break us down from God. Surely we will wonder how we could ever have doubted his goodness, for our faith will then be sight. So this is the contemporary views of heaven. There's a lot of contemporary views of heaven. Probably all of you have seen some of the movies that have made about people that have gone to heaven and come back. And uh, The very first night we met here about this study, I, I warned you to be careful with some of those things because uh, some of those things come back to haunt you. As Christians, if we run out without a lot of knowledge about a particular book or event or movie or whatever it is, and we promote those things, and then like one of those recently that, that the boy came out, when he, I think when he turned 16, and said none of it was true. You know, I just made it all up and, and it, you know, got us notoriety. We sold a lot of books, but none of it was true. Then, then before the whole world, not only is your testimony tarnished, but you make people question the validity of the Christian faith. So we've just got to be careful. It's not that some of those things may not have some validity to them. And all I'm saying is just be very earnest about checking things out. Uh, ask a lot of people. Talk to a lot of people. Uh, people that, that don't mind questioning um, before you go running off into some of those fields because it can put us in a bad way. But some contemporary approaches. Uh, there was a book and a best-selling novel called The Five People You Meet in Heaven. It portrays a, a, a man that has always felt very lonely and separated, and, and when he gets to heaven, he meets five people who tell him what a great impact he had on their lives. I mean, it's a wonderful story, isn't it? I mean, it makes you feel good. These five people come to you and they go, let me tell you how you affected my life so positively and how, 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 what a difference you made in my life. And for them, that is heaven. There's only one thing wrong with the book. You go all the way through the book and you get to the end. Never among those five people or anywhere else do you hear anything about him seeing or witnessing God or God's presence. It's totally absent. But these five people make him feel good. And that's, that's not heaven. Heaven is not about us. It's about him. And because it's about him, yeah, we'll feel good, but that's on the heaven side. You know, if you want something that's going to fluff you up now and make you just feel good now, there's a whole lot of stuff out there that can do that. But... You know, this, the reality is that it's all about God. And when you get there, that's going to be your joy. You know, there, there's a song not too many years ago about, uh, and, and it's a wonderful song. And I don't, I don't dissuade anybody from listening to the song, but it's a wonderful Christian song about uh, when you get to heaven and this person says, I remember when you told me, you know, about the Lord. And, uh, you know, wonderful song. But we've got to include God in all of that. You know, he is the primary fixture 
of heaven. Uh, there, this man, let's say, dies and goes to heaven, and he gets, he gets kind of built up. This sort of heaven, of which the Bible knows nothing, is a place for <coughs> therapeutic self-preoccupation rather than a preoccupation with the person of Christ. It's a therapeutic thing. Uh, it makes me feel good. But it doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what heaven's really like. So that's, that's our difference here. There's a 1998 movie called What Dreams May Come. And maybe some of you saw that. It portrays heaven as a beautiful place, yet shows it as, a love, as lo- lonely because a man's wife isn't there. Okay? It's lonely for him. He's very lonely, and I don't think heaven's going to be lonely. You see, we can have all kinds of warm, fuzzy movies and books written, that are so different than what the Bible presents heaven to be like. And when people read this stuff, particularly people that are either young Christians or non-Christians, and they read it and they think that's what heaven's going to be like, people read this and went, heaven's going to be a lonely place if you know, my certain people aren't there. It's going to be lonely. I, I remember an interview with um, Ted... The guy that owns the TV station, what's his name? Ted Turner. Ted Turner. And he made the comment, he says, I don't even want to go to heaven because none of my friends are going to be there. (laughs) He had the wrong idea of heaven. Wrong understanding of heaven. Heaven portrays heaven as a beautiful place, yet shows it as lonely. Remarkably, someone else is entirely missing from the movie, and that's, of course, God himself as well. So... But let's look at what this theologian, Jonathan Edwards, actually says, because this is, this is interesting. This was actually uh, from a 1733 sermon. Do you know that back in the day, this is really back in the day, back in the day, they used to have somebody sit and take note, ev- notes of every word the pastor said, and they would transcribe it for the congregation that week and mail it out to them, and it would go into magazines for certain guys like Jonathan Edwards, and he would be published. It was all published from his sermons. Uh, so you had these, these recorders that would sit in the churches and, and take the notes, and every word was, was uh, recorded. And here's, here's what he said. He says, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature. We're creatures. Uh, and the enjoyment of him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. What he is saying there is that whatever else heaven is in all of its glory, whatever else we might be doing there, absent God, it wouldn't be heaven. Uh, so to, to go to heaven fully to enjoy God is an infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows. But the enjoyment of God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. Many books and programs these days talk about messages uh, from the spirit realm. You know how many people... Uh, say, well, you know, they're spiritual. Well, to me, that means absolutely nothing. What that tells me is they could be messed up with Wicca, they could be New Agers, they could be any number of other, 5,000 other things. Uh, they could be ta- tampering in, uh, in with uh, Native American religions, they can be doing weird stuff. I had, I had a cousin who was a witch. She messed with Wicca all of her life. Uh, Very, very sad stories out of her. But I saw where that took her from a relatively innocent, beautiful young lady into a very horrible, horrible place. We've got a friend that was an astrologer and messed with all kinds of astrology and things and delved delved into that and and was uh, involved in witchcraft and all kinds of stuff like that. She was spiritual. People came to her for her spiritual prowess. She was, a, she, she was sought after and paid big money for what she knew about those things. 
And today she's a Christian and she goes all over the world talking to people about that subject and helping other people who are caught up in that life because she calls it the life because there is this whole life out there that exists that people uh, are seeking power, they're seeking all kinds of stuff. But she says, I was a very spiritual person. But we've got to make the distinction between contemporary spiritualism because I've also met a lot of shaman out on the Indian reservations that will tell you that they're the spiritual leaders of their tribes. So they're, they're messing in spiritual things. And there are many books and programs that talk about all kinds of messages from the spirit realm, supposedly from people who have died and now speak through channelers or mediums. Uh, have you ever noticed that although they claim to have come from heaven, and many of them do, have you ever seen, you've maybe seen even some shows on television that are based on this kind of a, a theme, that they, they claim to come from heaven, they'll talk to them through, through, uh, to these mediums, and supposedly the mediums are channeling their dead relatives, which were warned against somewhere over in Samuel, I believe. But we're, we're dealing with all of these things, and yet most of them never do talk about God the Father. Most of them never talk about Jesus, except for sometimes you hear them talk about a Jesus, and then when they start talking about him, you realize, this isn't the Jesus I know. This isn't the Jesus of the Bible. I mean, you, you talk, to, talk to somebody in Islam, a Muslim. They believe in Jesus. They believe he was a prophet. And they'll tell you, we believe in Jesus. There's nothing different about you. But, he, of course, he wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. He wasn't deity. And now... He exists only in the third heaven where Muhammad's in the highest heaven. He is much lower than Muhammad, you see. So that's not the same Jesus, is it? So we, we, we've got to be careful. This, uh, when, the, when the apostle John, though, was shown heaven and he wrote about it to the church, he records all the details of heaven. But over and over and over and over again, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about God. He's talking about this, this one who makes heaven what it is. So one who has actually been there and done those things comes back with a very different report than what you hear from a lot of these contemporary spiritualists. Here's what Randy Alcorn says. He says, the presence of God is the essence of heaven, just as the absence of God is the essence of hell. Because God is beautiful beyond measure, if we knew nothing more than that heaven was God's dwelling place, it would be more than enough. The best part of life on the new earth will be enjoying God's presence, having him actually dwell among us. Just as the Holy of Holies contained the dazzling presence of God in ancient Israel, so now will the new Jerusalem contain his presence, but on a much larger scale. The new Jerusalem, there is no temple. Everyone will have total, unimpeded access to God the Father. Not only has the veil been rent, the walls of the Holy of Holy have come down. You are in the presence always of a holy God. We will be in the eternal holy of holies. And, and that's the totality of heaven. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of thought, I think, should permeate our, our understanding of what heaven is. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 That's, that's exactly what, he's exactly right. Samuel Rutherford, old-time theologian, he says it this way. Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without thee, it would be a hell. And if I could be in hell and have thee still, it would be a heaven to me, for thou art all the heaven I want. Uh, I think he understood. Okay, let's talk about this relational peace and enjoyment because this is, this is one of those things I, I tried to start to put our arms around at the first of tonight. But I think if we could actually get a hold of this and really begin to understand it, that we would have a totally different thought process about our own uh, eventuality to be in heaven. About the, uh, also about the, um, the importance, the critical importance of salvation. 
We would, we would look at the unsaved totally differently if we just had a little bit of this grasp of what we're about to talk about. I, I believe that more of us would become adamant about sharing Jesus Christ with those that don't know him. I, I, I think we would have to if we really believe what we're going to talk about right now. Because you, if you totally understand the difference between this place we call heaven and the place we call hell and what it's like to be with God in an un, unimpeded access where there's no, no barriers between you and where the relationship is totally holy and pure, uh, we would have a very different view of our life here and now and the importance of what we do every day and how we live out our life. We'll worship Jesus as the Almighty and bow down to him in reverence, yet we'll never sense his disapproval. Can you, can you think about that? We'll never sense his disapproval because we'll never disappoint him. Unbelievable. We'll never disappoint him. Uh, that's, that's not an amen, that's a hallelujah. Uh, because we'll never disappoint him. We'll, we'll never be unhappy. He'll never be unhappy with us. We'll be able to relax in heaven. The other shoe will never drop. No skeletons will fall out of our closets. Christ bore every one of our sins. He paid the ultimate price so that we would be forever free from sin and the fear that all that sin brings and means. If we can get a hold of that, I believe this. I believe if, if, if in the next week half the people in this room could get a hold of that, that we would not only pack out this church every Sunday, we would have to have several services, uh, and it would be like one little church we went to in Africa where we went to preach. And, and uh, I mean, you think you're, you're remote here? We went to this little church, and we drove, and we drove, and we drove, and we drove, and we drove. We didn't see any houses, and we drove and drove some more, and we still didn't see any houses. And we drove and drove and drove, and we pulled up to this little building with ten sides. Obviously, they had been taken off of something else, and they got the tin roof and just made sides out of it. And a tin roof with holes po poked through it where the sun rays could come through, a dirt floor. And I thought, ain't nobody coming here. I mean, we hadn't seen any houses in the last 100 miles. And we got there about an hour before the service was supposed to start. And at the time the service was supposed to start, there were a couple of women in the yard with big black pots and a couple of chickens. They wrung their necks, and they started plucking them and throwing the chickens in the pot. And then, uh, but nobody was there to, to hear the message. And so we were there a little bit, and a few people came in, and then a few more came in, and a few more came in. And pretty soon the house was packed, and they had little logs that had been split down the center, and they were set on top of other little pieces of wood, and that was, was the pews where people sat on, these little half logs about that big around with a flat top on them. And that, those were the pews. And they sat there. And people started coming in. That whole place filled up. Well, they had shutters that were the only windows. There weren't any glass in the windows. So they opened up these shutters, and people started hanging in the windows. And started looking, and there were people like five and six deep outside. And they were, they just kept coming. And then, you know, I, I started preaching, and we had a translator there, and he was translating into three different languages. And, and so I would say, da 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 da, and he would go, da 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 da, and then he would change languages and go, da 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 da, and then he would change language again, and he would, da 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 da. And by that time, I'd lost my total train of thought, you know. And so it was, it was a challenge just to get through the message. But I preached about an hour and a half. And uh, he, he, he could tell I was winding down. And he punched me with his elbow. And he said, preach on, Pastor. They're just starting to get here. <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, people just kept gr growing in the yard. There was no microphone or anything there. So he just, he, every once in a while he said, louder, louder. And then I noticed everything he translated was, he was screaming because the people outside were trying to hear. We would have a place that people would walk. I talked to one lady after that was over. 
she had two little ones. She had a, she had a, a, a toddler and she had an infant that wasn't even beginning to crawl yet. She had walked for three days and three nights, not to hear me because she had never heard of me, to hear somebody that was going to talk about Jesus. Just, she had a little glimpse of what somebody had told her about Jesus, and it was important enough to her that she, she walked three days and three nights with an infant and a toddler. Somewhere, somebody had cast a vision of, that, was, that was so important to her of who Jesus is that she was willing to do that. And, and they didn't want to leave. I mean, nobody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted me to quit. It's unusual. <laughs> but that can, that can happen in America. That can happen here. If we would just get a little piece of that right there. I, I believe that. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When we're most satisfied in him, when, there's, when there is a wonder about the relationship, when there is a right sense of who he is, and not only who he is, but that, he, that knowing who he is, that he would want to have a relationship with me. If we understand that that's who he is, and he still wants to have a relationship with me, the wonder in that and the awe of that should kick us into high gear. And we really should want to tell just about everybody we meet about this Jesus. It, it would change who we are if we got a glimpse of this. Randy Alcorn again says, Christ's desire for us to see his glory should touch us deeply. What an unexpected compliment that the creator of the universe has gone to such great lengths at such sacrifice to prepare a place for us where we can behold and participate in his glory. That the, the creator of all things, that God himself would, would condescend in order that we would be allowed to come and be with him. When I say condescend, what I mean is condescending to become man flesh and blood, to be beaten and spat upon by us, to be abused by us, to die, and when he dies on the cross, bear the burden of all of our sins and all of the sins of the world up to that point and that ever would be. Why? Because he loves us. If, if, we, if we could just get a hold of that, it would change us. Jesus the servant in heaven. Now this, you may have never seen this, and this is going to blow your mind a bit. Let me, let me plant the seed before we go here. Do you remember the event at the Last Supper? Before there was the, the, the um, Passover meal, what took place? Jesus comes and washes the feet of the disciples. Can you imagine that moment I would have been like Peter. No way, Jesus. Not going to wash my feet. Mm -mm. I can't have you do that. Now, I want you to keep that picture in mind because Jesus is who? He is God. Okay? So, how does that translate in heaven? Look at this. Jesus said, It will be good for those servants whose, ma whose master finds them watching when he comes. I will tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. This amazing passage, Jesus says that the master will do something culturally unthinkable. Become a servant to his servants. Why? Because he loves them and also out of appreciation for their loyalty and service to him. The king becomes a servant, Matthew 20, 28. The king becomes a servant, making his servants kings. Notice that he won't merely command others to be servants to them, or he serves them. 
He will do it himself. He will be in, uh, we will be in heaven only because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We must ascend, assent to Christ's service for us, John 13, 8. We must assent to Christ's service for us. But even in heaven, it appears Jesus will sometimes serve us. What greater and more amazing reward could it be, could it be oursel- ours in the new universe than to have Jesus choose to serve us? Now let's talk about this just a minute. If this were our idea, this would be blasphemy. If this was, if, if we were commanding God to be a servant to us, that would be a blasphemous thing because he's God and we're creatures. He is creator, we are creatures. But he is choosing to serve us. And I think that part of what Christ did at the washing of the feet is imagery for this that is to come. Now, I'll tell you, this, there has to be a perfect relationship between us and God the Father for this kind of action to take place, or we would all be like Peter and go, we can't, we can't do this, God. We can't sit here and let you serve us. But there is a, a different relationship. There is a relationship that God says, I am going to serve you, and I am your God. Now, this obviously is not the standard state, but it is something that the Bible says will occur. If it was our idea, it would be blasphemy, but it is his idea. It is unthinkable. In our present state, it's unthinkable. It is truly amazing. You talk about amazing grace. It's amazing grace manifested. And it ought to be a cause for us to worship. It ought to be a cause for us to change our daily activity, to realize that God has not only sent his son to die for us and to serve us, uh, to become atonement for our sins and to go and prepare a place for us, but one day he will take us to heaven and he chooses in that time to actually serve us. Think about all the people that, and maybe you have even thought this at some time, Why does God demand our worship? Does he need that? (coughs) Maybe you think like, uh, was it Christopher Hitchens I quoted last week? I can't remember, but where he says that he he calls God basically an arrogant God that gets mad at his children because they worship other gods and all of that. This is the God we serve. And he loves you that much. He wants us to be with him. And he wants us to be his, his testimony in this, in this world. And if getting this little piece of heaven, this little bit of an understanding of heaven and who God is, could just crawl inside of our skin and really get under our skin a bit and change us from the inside out, wouldn't this be a different place? Yeah, I think if we get that, that all the things that we fear to do that God calls on us to do will seem minor. It'll seem, it'll seem relatively unimportant in terms of our discomfort to go and just be about doing those things. I think it changes us, and it changes us from being pe- people of fear to, to people of just wanting to share his glory. Uh, and so when we talk about heaven... It's not only for us to understand where we're going to go one day. It's for us to understand what we need to be about doing now and how it ought to change us now and how we ought to, to frame this in our own thought process is to embrace all that heaven is, yes, but the one who who did that for us. If we will embrace him, then we'll be different creatures now. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Say a prayer for us, Trump.